Well, this morning we're going to look at trust God for a peaceful, refreshed life. I kind of like peaceful. I kind of like being refreshed. And I guess I like living for, for now. But anyway, uh, we can trust God and he will supply. We open in Isaiah 26, 3. So in Isaiah 26, 3, we read, Thou will keep him in perfect peace. Anybody here want to be in perfect peace? Then this is a good verse to read. In fact, the, the Hebrew reads, Thou will keep him in shalom, shalom. Peace, peace. Not just peace, but double the peace. God will keep you in double the peace and perfect peace. I guess they couldn't figure out peace, peace, so they just said perfect peace. Who and how? Whose mind is stayed on the insanity of the world. No, it doesn't say that, does it? Well, that's one of the ways to get rid of perfect peace. Whose mind is stayed on thee. Why? Because he trusts in thee. You trust in God. You think of the things of God. And you stay your mind there. You keep it there. Despite everything out there trying to move you away. And you will end up in peace, peace. Trust, verse 4, trust ye in the Lord forever. God, you know, one of the great things about God is, you know, uh, the contract doesn't expire. He's with us all the time. Trust in the Lord forever, for in the Lord Jehovah is everlasting strength. Everlasting strength, or one translation has it, for he is our everlasting rock. And a rock was symbolic of strength. It, it didn't wear away. Uh, in fact, uh, many times you do a treaty around a rock. Uh, you, got, you got stones of witness with Joshua. So you stay your mind on him because he's an everlasting strength. You go to Proverbs 3, 5 next. And he, he, as you trust in him, as you think about him, as you stay your mind and consider him, he will keep you in perfect peace. Uh, go to Proverbs 3, because if you continue to read the word and meditate on it, it's a lot better than reading anything else. Uh, Proverbs 3, 5, again, this is a, a, a very familiar verse, but it says, trust. Uh, one translation has it, confide. I don't like that. You don't just confide in anybody. You trust or confide in the Lord, and you do with all your heart. You open up to God, because God knows anyway. And God then can help because you're staying your mind. You're talking to him. Trust, confide in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean out on your own understanding. You're not going to be able to figure it all out. In all thy ways, again, in all thy ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct or make smooth or make straight, straight or rightly divide thy path. Here's the point. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but you'll know the right direction to go. You'll know what's going to be best for your life. So God will direct it. Okay, you want me to do what, God? All right, let's do it. He'll direct it. It's good to know that you're on the right path with him instead of you're out there wandering in a field somewhere. In all thy ways, if you acknowledge him, stay your mind on him, keep him in the forefront, he can rightly divide or direct your path. Right? It's orthotomeo in the Septuagint. So verse 7 again is that great encouragement. Be not a wise guy in your own eyes. Just don't think you know it all because you don't. Uh, God knows the future. He knows what's the best path for you. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart. Avoid. Shun evil. Because that's if you don't stay your mind there, evil will have a tendency to creep in. And the end result of trusting, acknowledging him directing your path, it shall be health to thy navel. For navel is flesh. Your flesh will be healthy and marrow to thy bones. And marrow is nourishment or refreshment. You will be refreshed. You will be nourished. You will have health because you won't be all over the world, all over the place, not knowing what to do. Stay with God, keep walking with God, keep moving with God, and God will take care of you. God, you can trust him. He will, uh, go to 2 Corinthians 1. So, uh, you want nourishment? You want refreshment? You want your flesh to just be more peaceful? Trust in the Lord. 
because you know one of the worst things in the world is not knowing i just don't know exactly what to do or what the problem is or what's happening well hey we've read the end of the book and it's really good so we continue to trust god we continue to walk with god uh second corinthians we jump to the new testament here god's going to make straight our paths we'll we'll be able to know we're in the right path when we built our big building we had an artist uh, I had to uh, do a, a winding road, a path, and there's a lot of grass and other obstacles along the way, but we're on the path. 2 Corinthians 1, 18. Why can we trust God? Uh, verse 18, 2 Corinthians 1, 18 says, but as God is true, well, there's one of the reasons God is true. Uh, we don't even have to fact check God, but as God is faithful, God is faithful. God is true. And then Paul saying, hey, our word toward you was not yea and nay. The, he, Paul was being accused of uh, fast, uh, you know, going back and forth, of vacillating back and forth on coming to visit these guys and how he's treating them. But he's saying, no, 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 no. For the Son of God, verse 19, Jesus Christ, who was preached among you by us, me, Silas, and Timothy, he isn't yea and nay. We didn't go back and forth in him, but in him, in God, it's yea, right? It's always yea. And I feel like we should put a little emoji there, you know? Uh, hey, anytime I'm talking to you about the Son of God, about Jesus Christ, and about how faithful God is, you get a little smiley face. You get an emoji that says yes, because it tells us that in verse 20. For all the promises of God in him are yea. They all deserve a yes emoji, right? A thumbs up. For all the promises of God in him through Christ are yay. Yay. All right. And in him, they're amen. <laughs> it's going to come to pass. It's going to happen. And it will all happen to the glory of God. And then they brought it to him by us. Okay. So all the promises in God are yay. We're not doing, God's not a nay. <laughs> God's a yay. And God will be taking care of us. And you can trust all the promises that are there. Look at 2 Peter 3. Hebrews, James, 2 Peter 3, 8. God is faithful. God is true. All of his promises deserve an emoji that say yes. 2 Peter 3, 8. And we read. But, beloved, don't be stupid, right? Don't be ignorant. Don't be, you know, don't overlook this one thing. This is kind of important, God saying, you know, hey, don't, don't overlook this. Don't be ignorant when it, comes to, when it comes to God that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. So we'll be living a thousand years. Since, well, no, that's kind of what God is saying is that it's a great figure of speech here. One day with the Lord might as well be a thousand years. A thousand years is like one day to the Lord. And he's quoting Psalm 90, verse 4 here. And verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promises or delaying. Come on, Lord, send Christ back. You know, the Lord's not delaying concerning his promises as some men consider a delay. But instead, God is patient toward us. I mean, that's good to know. God's not delaying his promises. He's patient. That's a big difference. Not wishing or not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. And that's the reason. God is patient. God would love to send the son back, but it's not right because he's willing, wishing that more join the family of God. He, one year's like, you know, one day's like a thousand years to him anyway, so it doesn't matter. So he's patient. Mankind's not quite as patient, but he's patient. And he's, because he's patient, he's, he's not delaying his promises because he can't fulfill them. He just wants more to spend eternity with him. That's the reasoning behind it. God's preference, all saved. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to look at one verse, then we're going to look at uh, a chapter and a half. But I want to start here. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13. 1 Thessalonians 2, 13, we read, For this cause also thank we God without ceasing. 
We're thankful to God all the time. Why? Because when you, Paul said, when you received the word of God, what you heard of us, when we taught the word, you accepted it. You received it. You accepted it, not as the word of men, but as it is in truth, the word of God, which effectually works also in you that believe. This works. You want the patience? You want the refreshed life? You want to be peaceful? Spend some time in the book. All right? When you receive it, you read it not as the words of men, but it's the word of truth. It's the word of God. And it will effectually work. It will bring God's results. Sometimes you have to be a little patient, but it brings God's results to our lives. All right, go to uh, 1 1. Uh, I'm going to read you from the working translation, 1 Thessalonians 1 1. Okay? So we're going to look at how they entered in and how the people in Thessalonica reacted to it and how it changed their lives. And it wasn't easy. Paul, Silas, Timothy, to the church of the Thessalonians, in God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, grace and peace to you. We give thanks to God continually for all of you, making mention of you in our prayers, constantly remembering your work. Now, these are the things they're going to constantly remember in prayer. They're reminding them of the right way of believing and uh, your hard labor of the right manner of love and your patience of the right hope in our Lord Jesus Christ before our God and Father. The, the article is there, which is specific. The hope, the right hope, the right love, the right believing compared to all the other ones that out there that are wrong. We're remembering that the believers in Thessalonica in hard labor to love. They had patience when it came to the hope. Their work was based upon believing what God wanted them to do. Verse 4, we do this knowing, brothers beloved by God, his choosing of you. It could go either way, but from the context and from the way the Greek construction is, it's not you choosing God, but God choosing you. We do this knowing, brothers beloved by God, his choosing of you. Because our gospel came to you not only in word, but also in power and in Holy Spirit and complete certainty with full conviction. When we spoke the gospel, we backed it up with the power of God. We didn't just be used car salesmen, just came in talking. No, no, we operated the power of God. We showed the proof, the power through the Holy Spirit. We know, brothers, this choosing of you, because our gospel didn't, wasn't just word, but in power, Holy Spirit, and complete certainty. God backed up his word. We said it. We operated the power of God. And you saw with full conviction, with complete certainty, just as you know the manner of men we became among you for your sake. You also then became imitators of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction, but with joy from the Holy Spirit. Thus you became a model for all those who believe in Macedonia and Achaia. In fact, from you, the word of the Lord sounded out. Not only in Macedonia and Achaia, which is northern and southern Greece, which Thessalonica is in, but in every place you're believing with regard to God has spread abroad, so that there's no need for us to say anything about it. Everybody's talking about your believing and what you're doing there. But as a matter of fact, verse 9, they who have believed report things about us, namely what kind of entry we had to you. You know, they talk about what Paul, Silas, and Timothy, when they came in, they accepted the word, and then they turned to God from idols. These guys were Gentiles, all right? Gentiles worshiped all kinds of make-believe stuff. You turned to God from idols, and now you serve the living and true God, and to wait with expectation for his son from heaven. You've got a genuine hope whom he raised from the dead, namely Jesus, who delivered us from the wrath to come. The wrath to come, the period of the next administration, that wrath time, you have been delivered from it because it will not be good. Chapter 2. Moreover, brothers, you yourselves know that our entry to you had not been in vain. But after we had previously suffered and had been abused at Philippi, you read Acts, you know what happened to them. The, uh, that's where they got beaten, thrown in jail, and they started singing, and the Philippian jailer was going to kill himself and says, no. And they went home, got a whole family born again. As you know, 
we were bold in our God to speak the gospel of God to you with much contending. So we left there. We came to Thessalonica, and there was contending, contention everywhere. But we were bold with the word of God. Moreover, our exhortation was not of delusion and not of uncleanness, nor with deceit. But verse 4, as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel. You ever thought about that? God has entrusted you with the good news of Christ. He didn't give it to the angels. He gave it to mankind. We have been entrusted with the good news concerning Christ. We, us, God gave it to us. So what do we do? We go golfing instead. No, we, we're, we're, we have been entrusted with it, so we speak. Not as pleasing people, but God who proves our hearts. Now, speak the truth. You know, you won't be pleasing people, but you will be pleasing God. But there'll be some that will believe. Moreover, as you know, we did not at any time use a word of flattery for a pretext for greediness, and God's our witness. Nor did we seek glory from people, neither from you or anybody else, although we could have been a burden as apostles of Christ. Instead, we were gentle. We were childlike among you even as a nursing mother tenderly cares for her children. So having a fine affection for you, we were pleased to impart to you not only the gospel of God, but also our own souls, because you had become beloved to us. Moreover, brothers, you remember our hard and exhausting labor, working night and day so that we might not overburden any of you. We heralded the gospel of God to you. You and God are witnesses how devotely and justly and blamelessly we were with you who believe. Even, verse 11, you know how we, as a father with his own children, how we encouraged you, how we comforted you, and we testified to each one of you so that you could walk worthily of God who called you to his kingdom and glory. For this reason, we also thank God constantly. Because when you received the word of God that you heard from us, you did not accept it as the word of men, but as it truly is the word of God, which also works in you who believe. And moreover, brothers, you became imitators of the churches of God that are in Christ Jesus in Judea, because you also suffered the same thing by your own countrymen, even as they did by the Judeans. You became imitators of the church in Judea, and you suffered persecution from your own countrymen, just like what was happening with the Jews there in Israel, in, uh, in Judea, starting in Jerusalem. And now he's going to describe how what they did. And uh, let me start with 14, go right into 15 again. Moreover, brothers, you became imitators of the churches of God that are in Christ Jesus in Judea. The churches, there's a bunch of churches, not just in Jerusalem, but throughout Judea. Because you also suffered the same things by your own countrymen, your own next door neighbors, your own people, even as they did the Judeans. But these Judeans, they killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets, and they persecuted us. And who were not pleasing to God, they persecuted, and who were contrary to all people. They have forbidden us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved in order to even pile up their sins and the wrath is to come upon them in the end. So basically, um, it will not be good for them. They killed the Lord Jesus Christ. They killed the prophets. They're trying to stop the word from moving to the Gentiles. Everything about this is disgusting. And I love the fact that it says they, it's just piling up their sins. Uh, piling up their sins and the wrath on them. Oh, it'll be there. Yeah. Look at um, Galatians 1. Galatians 1, verse 6. God's word works in those who believe. And that's the key. So don't let anyone or anything steal your trust in God. If you keep going to God, looking at God, talking to God, thinking about God, you're not, you're gonna have, you're gonna be refreshed. You're gonna be peaceful. You're gonna have direction. Galatians 1 6. I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you into the grace of Christ unto another or a different gospel. He's just astonished that it didn't take these people in Galatia long before they got talked out of the greatness of the word of God, you know, which is not another. It's not acceptable. It's not an alternative. All right. Uh, you know, what we taught you on the grace of Christ is where you need to continue to stay. 
Does anything else, it's just not true. But there be some that, you know, trouble you, that agitate you, and would pervert, would alter the gospel of Christ. They came in speaking the freedoms about Christ, and then the religious people came in and said, no, 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 you got to add works, you got to do the law, you got to do all this other stuff. And he's saying, why are you falling for this? But though, but though, verse 8, but though we, or an angel from heaven, preach any other gospel, if we make anything up, if anybody else comes, and they preach anything different than what we originally preached to you, than that which we have preached unto you, they need to be accursed, because they're off the word of God, they're spreading lies, false in your windows, and all the other problems. As we said before, so say I now again, if any man preach any other gospel unto you than you have received, let him be accursed. He's making his point. God's establishing it. Here, verse 8, verse 9. If they bring in any other thing outside of the simplicity in Christ, don't believe them. They're accursed. For do I now persuade men or God? Or do I seek to please men? For if I yet pleased men, I should not be the servant of Christ. And that's who we want to be. Look at 2 Timothy 2. We continue, don't let anything, no alternative. One Christ, one Messiah, not works, except his, his accomplishments. Uh, 2 Timothy 2.1. 2 Timothy 2.1 we read, Now therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. As you continue to stay your mind, you continue to trust God, you continue, continue to do things, you got to. You have to stay strong in grace. Grace is the starting point, not legalism. It's grace. Jesus Christ came because of God's grace, favor for all of us. We have to stay strong because it's real easy to fall into legalism and make laws and rules and don't touch this and touch that, whatever. No. Thou, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit. Or the same, not another gospel, not an alternative gospel from Galatians, but the same. The same commit or entrust the faithful men. Find faithful people out there and entrust the accuracy of the word of God to them. And here's an example of what they would be. Who shall then be competent, be able, competent to teach others also. They will so learn the word that they then can Keep into the next generation. Who shall be able or competent to teach others also? Thou therefore endure hardships as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. All right? You're going to, you know, um, you're going to suffer, uh, you know, training. You know, if you're a soldier, you, you know, just don't walk in one day, they put a slap a uniform on you, uh, and hey, you're now a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No, that's not what it is talking about at all. You're suffering hardship. You got training, right? And no man that get that is serving or warring, no man that serves entangles himself with the affairs of this life, right? You don't. If you're in the military, if you're in a, you know in a shootout, you're not considering your stock portfolio, your stock portfolio, or anything like that. You're not. You don't want to be entangled mentally with the wrong things that just steal your peace. Steal your time, steal your effort. No man that you know that serves entangles themselves. You know, you gotta live in the world, you gotta have some affairs of the world, but you don't get entangled in the affairs of this life. So you can please him who has enlisted you to be a soldier. Now he's gonna move to a different analogy, which is the athletic analogy. And if a man also strive for masteries, if he competes in the athletic games, he is not crowned, right? He doesn't get the reward, except he competes. He strives lawfully. you got to play by the rule book. Okay? You're supposed to play by the rule book. Uh, if you're going to contend, you're not going to get crowned unless you're doing it lawfully. You're doing it properly. You're doing it because of the accomplishments of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the farmer, the husband, then, the farmer that labors must be first partaker of the fruits. Well, yeah, he plants, he waters. When we go to, you know, to uh, Anna's garden, we expect to be fed well. But she's the one who has to eat first to make sure everything is good. She should be. But she planted it. She watered it. She did everything, and God gave the increase. So, verse 7 says, consider what I'm trying to tell you people. It's the same. 
and let the Lord give thee understanding in all things. And we want understanding. We want direction. We want now so we can be refreshed, so we can be peaceful. Look at verse 19, 219. Nevertheless, the foundation of God stands solid. The foundation of God. And that's what we're going to stand on. We're going to stand on the foundation of God, dealing with the chief cornerstone, who is Jesus Christ. The foundation of God stands solid. Knowing this seal, the Lord knows them that are his. He knows you. The Lord knows them that are his. And let everyone that names the name of Christ, actually, it's the Lord. And let everyone that names the name of the Lord depart from iniquity. If you're going to name the name of the Lord, you're going to live that way. Depart from injustice. Okay? Look at 4. 2 Timothy 4.1. All right, I'm going to give you a charge. I'm charging you before God and before the Lord Jesus Christ. Here's a charge. I charge thee, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who will judge the living and the dead, even at his appearing and his kingdom. So, what should we do? Preach the word. Talk about the word. Talk about Jesus Christ. Be instant, right? Stand ready with the word in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all patience, long-suffering, and doctrine. You got to know the word to be able to talk the word and to talk accurately with the word. And we're, it doesn't matter when, if it's convenient or not. You just do it, you know, with patience, understanding the doctrine, reprove, rebuke. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own cravings, they're going to heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. And instead, they're going to believe another gospel, like from Galatians. They're going to believe fables, myths. They're going to believe all kinds of other stuff except the accuracy of the word of God. And that's out there. That's real. That's happening. Verse 7. And then Paul says, look, I have fought a good fight. I have been a great competitor. Right? I've contended in the games. I have finished my race. I have kept the right way of believing henceforth. Because of what I did, there is laid up for me. There is reserved for me. A crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge or the just judge, is going to repay me, is going to reward me, is going to give me at that day because of his efforts on earth. Earth, it's not available for every, It's available for everybody, but they have to earn it. Here, the, the righteous judge is going to repay Paul at that day, not to me only, but unto all of them also that love his appearing. So this crown of justness, uh, from the just judge is available for all who love his appearing. Which means, hey, we're all looking forward to it, but are you living life towards it? That's what he's talking about here. Second Corinthians 4, verse 1. Second Corinthians 4, 1, we read, Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, we've been given the ministry of reconciliation. We have been given the ministry of bringing people back, amending the rupture, bringing, Christ, uh, bringing people through Christ back to God. Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. We're not discouraged. We don't lose heart. We're, we got a ministry. We got to put out effort. It takes time. The honor of righteousness is waiting for you. As we have received mercy, though, we faint not. But we have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty, the shameful things, not walking in craftiness, right? not handling the word of God deceitfully, not watering it down, adulterating it. Some painters I know would throw a lot of extra water in their paint so it would stretch further. We're not going to adulterate the pureness of the word of God. All right, We don't handle the word craft, craftiness dishonestly. We don't handle the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are perishing. Uh, the word hid is veiled. The gospel's veiled, right? You've been wearing masks. The gospel has, you know, got a mask on. It's hid. It's veiled to them that are perishing. And whom the God of this age has blinded the minds. He's blinded the thinking processes 
of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves. But well, what do we preach? Whether it's convenient or not, we preach Christ Jesus the Lord. And ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. For God, who commanded the light to shine out of darkness, has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure. We have the treasure of Holy Spirit in these clay earthen vessels, that the excellency of the power may be of God and not because of our own wisdom. It's because of God. It's what he's allowed us to learn and to live and to show as an example. We preach Christ. We operate the power of God. We believe and trust in what the word says. Uh, look at verse 13. But we, having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, I believed. I believed. We all here have believed, and therefore we speak. Right? We, have I spoken? We also believe, and therefore we speak. He speaks. He's teaching others. They believe. They speak, knowing that he, which raised up the Lord Jesus, shall raise up us also by Jesus, and shall present us with you. We're going to be raised up. We're going to have a new spiritual body. For all things, verse 15, for all things are for your sakes, that the abundant grace might through the thanksgiving of many abound to the glory of God. For which cause we faint not. We don't get discouraged. Don't get discouraged. Keep your head in the word and thinking about God and what Christ accomplished. You won't get discouraged. For which cause we faint not. We're not discouraged. But though our outward man is perishing, although our outward man is decaying, yet the inward man is renewed day by day. For our light affliction or for our light momentary affliction, which is but for a moment. It's amazing how fast life goes. It works. It uh, produces for us a far more exceeding and eternal heavy weight of glory while we focus. Where should our focus be? The word look is focus. While we focus not on the things which are seen. We don't concentrate and spend all our life on the things that we can see with our five senses. But at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen, they're temporary, temporal, temporary. They're transient. But the things which are not seen are eternal. We have eternal life with eternal rewards and a great future. And we focus on that. And that just enriches our life. Uh, chapter 6, verse 1. We then as workers together with him, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. You know, you ever give somebody something you thought was a very valuable and they didn't do anything with it? Well, you've been given the valuable uh, Holy Spirit, you've got a tremendous gift, right? Walk worthy of it. We then, as workers together with them, beseech you also that you receive not the grace of God in vain. For he says, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. When? Now, today. Oh, yo, right? Now is the accepted time. Now is the day, day of salvation. You've learned it? Live it today, now. Give no offense in anything that the ministry then won't be blamed. Um, today is the day of salvation. Now. It's available now. Uh, it's good to know now. We go to 2 Thessalonians. Back there. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we pick up 2 Thessalonians 1.11. Wherefore also, uh, 2 Thessalonians 1.11. Wherefore also we pray always for you, that our God would count you worthy, that our God would consider you worthy of his calling. Right? You received the call. You answered the call. You believed regarding the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you're living it. You're walking worthily of that calling and fulfill all the good pleasure of his goodness and the work of faith with power that the name of our Lord Jesus Christ may be glorified in you and ye in him according to the grace of our God and the Lord Jesus Christ. Because of grace, 
but we can walk worthy of it. Chapter 2, now we beseech you, brethren, but the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto him, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or being troubled, neither by a spirit, nor by word, nor by letter, and that's in a, by, you know, an epistle. Don't be troubled. And, you know, don't be disturbed because of what people are trying to throw out there and say it's of God. <laughs> We're not shaken in mind. We're not disturbed by a spirit, by the uh, word that's wrongly taught, by an epistle is from us, is that the day of the Lord is at hand. Let no man deceive you by any means. For that day is not going to come except there come a departure, a falling away first, the man of sin be revealed. And the son of perdition, one of the things that's happening in the first century, oh, Christ already came back. You guys are still here. It's not, he's not coming back again. No, again, that would be opposite. That would be untruth uh, against the word of God. Uh, and I don't care if, if it's an angel or somebody who thinks he's an apostle, bring all that up. We only agree with what the word says. And we don't get talked out of it. All right? So there, eventually there will be a departure. There will be the gathering together. And then after that, the man of sin be revealed, the son of perdition, the son of destruction, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God, for that is worship, so that he as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. And over the myriad of the last couple thousand years, a lot of people who thought they were gods uh, became powerful. But they all died. They really weren't a god, even though they thought and said they were. And we go to 1 Thessalonians 5, and we close there. Just remember, Christ is coming back, and it's all based upon Christ and not any man on earth today. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18, in everything, give thanks, because this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. So, in everything, just give thanks. Be thankful. Uh, verse 21, but prove all things. Hold fast that which is good. A lot of false stuff out there. A lot of exhortation of other people rather than Jesus Christ in the word. Prove all things with the word of God and hold fast that which is good. In verse 24, faithful, trustworthy is he that calls you who also will. Do it. God will do it. All the promises are going to happen. Enjoy today. Trust in God and have a peaceful, refreshed, enjoyable life by keeping and thinking of God, His Son, the Holy Spirit, the Word of God, and all the great things you've been given rather than immersing yourself in the world. You will not be very peaceful or refreshed that way. So God bless you. Enjoy today.